Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Process Podcast. Olivia Park, welcome back to The Process Podcast. Ed Haynes, thank you very much for having me again. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I am tired, but I am good. <laughs> I mean, we've actually just spoken for about, how long have you spoken for? 30 minutes, 45 minutes? We were like, shit, <laughs> yeah. we haven't even hit record yet. Let's start again. Uh, obviously, just we a quick introduction. Usual, we haven't had our usual catch up. We used to no, have a quite good catch up. So lots to talk about. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think for a bit of history, in case people haven't listened to you on previous episodes on the podcast, um, we, we used to work together as coach and athlete. Um, uh, you are a coach yourself. And, you know, now with a very clear, you know, vision and purpose, which we're going to hear all about. Um, but I guess kind of when, since we transitioned from coaching athlete, we've always just stayed connected, um, especially, you know, as you got into the coaching space and started to develop your own business. I know we had a lot of conversations there. And then we're just very like-minded on on training and health, although, you know, our markets, our, our niches differ somewhat, um, but we've always just seen eye to eye in, in terms of how we think fitness should be delivered and have our own stories in terms of, you know, what has brought us to having these really strong beliefs about sustainability, longevity, being able to manage life and training and find some form of balance, et cetera. And I also know that Liv, you are a relatively new mother, little mm. Alfie is now mm. part of you and Ed's family. Um, so congratulations. How's that Thank all going? Um, it's interesting. Yeah, Alfie is 11 weeks um, on Friday. So still pretty, pretty fresh. Um, but we live in South Korea. So I'm from New Zealand originally. You can probably hear my accent. Um, but we live in South Korea. And it's been pretty challenging, you know, like having a baby here and not having any support um, and I we've been here for about um, two oh, maybe nearly three years now and I don't have much of a community here because um, when we came here from Taiwan we were in Taiwan for four and a half years um, prior and COVID kind of came and so it's just been kind of a weird time and not really able to get out and you know be in a gym and stuff like that um, and then during my time here as well I was recovering from hypothalamic amenorrhea so I sort of wasn't in a gym which is where I would find my people I guess and community um, so yeah it's been kind of difficult to be going through um you know, having Alfie and not really having any support and sort of fumbling along on our own. Um, but uh, just making us stronger and more resilient and more trusting of ourselves, I guess. Liv, are you still moving to Hong Kong? Is that still going to happen? Well, just because of how Hong Kong is right now, no. So we were all set to go at the end of last year um, in November. We were about to just... Um, pull the trigger and come but then things with COVID just got really bad um, and then we were going to be coming over like now but still it's just impossible to kind of make that happen and so at this stage we just are staying put in Korea so we're still supposed to be in Shanghai in China we've been waiting for our visas for like It'll be about a year and a half. Um, so it's been a really weird time of just like sitting and waiting. And we were going to come to Hong Kong because we can't go to China. And I was like, I just, why are we in Korea? Because um, Ed, my husband, he now is um, just covering China. He's a journalist. Um, he doesn't do Korea anymore, but we just kind of haven't been able to go anywhere because of visas mm -hmm. and stuff. So I'm still gunning for Hong Kong. I'm still trying. <laughs> Oh, would love to see you here, Liv, as would the process program and coastal fitness community, for sure. Yes. Um, Liv, I know that getting pregnant with Alfie was not easy. Mm. Um, and I know there's lots of parts of that. And I know a big part of it was basically life before Alfie. Uh, so what I would actually love is, because I know bits and bobs of the story, I've obviously been a part of some chapters of your life where, you know, that has that contributed to to the um to Alfie but like take us way back like where did it all start tell me through like your whole training and health journey from little live till to adult live yeah well I obviously everybody's 
every single person's experience with fertility and pregnancy and everything like just as a disclaimer and like a massive caveat to everything is so nuanced and so individual um and for some people, it can be quite triggering if they are in a fertility journey right now, or, you know, there are struggles there, or there have been struggles, you know, whatever that kind of process is for people. Um, so I just want to put out there right now, like, if this is not the right time for you to listen to this, then please, you know, know that you can not listen to this. Um, but I think, I truly believe that Alfie, um, my son, is the byproduct of the way that I changed thinking about myself and thinking about fitness, thinking about my, my body and training <laughs> and food, um, because that was all the stuff that was not letting my body work properly and my body wasn't working properly. I wasn't able to get pregnant. Um, fertility just was not there for me um, because I, because of the way I viewed myself and the way that I abused myself with exercise and food. Um, so I, um, when was it maybe, um, about gosh, maybe about 14 years ago or something, 15 years ago, I started, I've always been kind of like in doing sport and I was a swimmer when I grew up, I danced, um, always kind of like doing bits and pieces. Um, and I've been lifting since I was like 14 years old. Um, and that was just part of doing swimming like being a competitive swimmer and I'm 37 now so I've been lifting weights doing resistance training like in the gym for a really long time um I had a bit of a break when I was at university it obviously just kind of like stopped everything um but it was actually when I was in Korea I came here to teach for a year um and that was about 15 years ago uh 15 years ago now um I started getting really into the gym when I was here. And I think it was because I'd gained quite a bit of weight, um, just drinking a lot of soju and um, mm. being young and being in Korea and kind of like income where you don't have to do anything with it and stuff. So I started getting really into the gym because I, I remember going for a walk around my apartment when I was here and I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't even breathe. Like this is so hard. And so um, I just started lifting weights at the gym, started running a little bit. And I lost a lot of weight really quickly and I got a lot of comments and stuff like that. And then it just kind of spiraled from there. So I actually came back home to New Zealand. Um, and from there, I started getting into um, bodybuilding competitions. So I sort of kept going to the gym and the manager of a gym was like, hey, do you want to try this? I was like, sure. Like, how hard can I train? Does this mean that I kind of can just like train really hard and I kind of have a reason for that? Um and so I did figure competitions for a couple of years. And at that same time, I found CrossFit. Um, so this was a really long time ago, um, 14, maybe about 2010, maybe I found CrossFit, I think maybe. So pretty early on. And, um, and I was trying to do the same, th trying to do CrossFit and uh, training for figure competitions at the same time, which was hilarious. Terrible Slather combination yeah slather keto on there as well and you've got yourself like dynamite um so I was kind of like in this weird place I stopped doing bodybuilding because I got I was just really interested in CrossFit um so I sort of pursued that more um and at this time I was um working in a CrossFit gym working in a gym personal training um so I was just like doing the most and I, when I got back from Korea, I actually, I realized that I didn't have my period. I came off the pill, didn't have a period. I went to a couple of doctors and they're like, you have to go on the pill for the rest of your life. If you want your period to come back. I was like, surely that's not right. Went to an endocrinologist. She was like, you're going to have to change your whole career. Stop working out, stop competing. Um, stop being a personal trainer. If you want to get your period back. And she was speaking at me from a place of your fertility is the most important thing about you and you want to have a baby. And at that stage, I was like, I don't want to have a baby. I'm like in my early twenties, like no way. Um, so that was just like, I dug my head in the sand. Cause I was like, well, of course I'm not going to change my career. Of course I'm not going to, you know, do there is, this makes no sense. 
Um, so then I just kept doing what I was doing. Um, and um, I was obviously, you know, I didn't get a period because I wasn't eating enough, right? So I was in low energy availability um, in a really bad place with food and my body from doing bodybuilding um, and all of the narratives that I'd picked up there. Um, I did have a history from when I was younger of kind of um, uh, sort of disordered eating and stuff like that. Um, but it was obviously heightened doing the um, bodybuilding. Um, and that just kind of continued. And so I just kept going for years and years and years without a period, training really hard, um, not eating enough, um, doing a whole lot of things like, yeah, paleo and keto and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and it was about in 2017, I think it was, it was when you and I were working together and I was in Taiwan by this stage, um, still coaching CrossFit, um, personal training, really high stress, you know, a lot of hours like on the floor and stuff like that. Um, and we were working together and I had to stop with you, which was really hard. Um, but I was like, I need to, something's wrong. And, um, I need to not have accountability to train, um, even though at that time, what I actually needed to do was tell you the truth. Mm. And I needed accountability to help me train in a better way. Because I, what I did from there, I didn't, I just I kept training really hard. And because I was on my own, um, but I was just training in a different kind of way. I wasn't doing CrossFit, but more kind of like functional bodybuilding kind of stuff. But I was still training hard. I was still under eating. Um, and I actually just got leaner and leaner and leaner um, until I got to a point where I was like, this is just not, I mean, I don't have a period. This is not right. And I was teaching this stuff. So as a female health and performance coach, you know, teaching about, you um, what is health for women and you know a major marker of that is having a healthy menstrual cycle you know so that's kind of like yeah where I got to and then I had to just um, make changes and start to gain weight um, stop training and work towards getting my period back um, and I got that back in January last year 2021 and then I got pregnant a couple of months later um, with Alfie but between that we had done IVF um, and that obviously had been unsuccessful because I just you know I just didn't have the sex hormones to support that um, and I also was looking for a way to not do the hard work to mm. actually get my health back and I was like I'm just going to rely on science because science is amazing it's like no, you actually need to do the most basic things, which is eat more, exercise less, sleep more, and manage your mind. And so with that, I truly believe like the way that I manage my mind and the way that I unpacked like everything about who I thought I was as a coach, what I thought I brought to the industry, being an athlete, my bo you know, body image, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Being able to have a baby is a byproduct of what I did with my mind. I'm, mm. I truly believe, yeah. Liv, I just want to it go a back lot. a little bit. Talk, you know, the the narrative that came, the self narrative that came from bodybuilding. What 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 was that self narrative? Mm. That Lena is better. Like Lena will always be better, no matter what the sacrifice. And there were a lot of sacrifices, like my relationship with my now husband you know that was that was really difficult um I didn't have a social life like friendships um the pain that I put myself through for just being like you're not good enough like restrict 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 like physically what I put myself through with exercise you know training um and not eating enough um and you know, not being the best coach that I could be as well, because I was just spending so much time obsessed about myself. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of room for what I could truly be um, giving to other people. And I think that that actually comes up a lot in the fitness industry, um, that there can be so much that we're thinking of, well, in order to walk the walk or talk the talk as a good trainer or coach I need to look like this because then people are going to work with me or buy from me um but you probably you know that can often be 
taking away what you could actually be giving to people because you're there's so much so you, you know it's so much time spent what do I have to do to impress people or mm. um do you know what I mean yeah yeah totally but I do think the person who gets sucked into that and I was 100% that person for a period of time um you also just don't have clarity on who your market is because essentially if that's you and you're thinking that's important and that's going to attract more clients. Essentially, what you're also saying is that this is what I'm going to do with my clients. So at that same point in time when I was restricting, uh, I was placing an emphasis on leanness. I was overdosing training and underdosing recovery. I was doing all those things with my clients as well. It was no right. surprise. Yeah. And this is, this is something that I talk about a lot, like on social media and stuff, is it's this wild, weird thing that we get stuck in is this expectation of the expectation of trainers and coaches that they think that everyone's coming to them for fat loss and everyone's coming to them to look better or, you know, whatever better is or whatever. And then the trainee is like, oh, that's my only option. So mm. that's what I should be pursuing. And so the trainees are coming to see the trainers and they're like, well, if you're not working me hard, if I'm not sweating and if I'm not dying, like by the end of the session, I'm, I've been gypped, you know, like what's the point? Like I'm not getting my money's worth because isn't this all about changing my body, you know? Um, and so we stay stuck in this like really challenging cycle. And I was talking about this on my stories um, a couple of weeks ago that I think it takes a very, very brave trainer or coach to step out of that and be like, let's not, you know, like, let's talk about what actually is going on um, and going into the deeper kind of thing. And this is not about like, what is your why, you know, and my why is to keep up with my kids and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that can be a thing. Um, but often that can be like masking people feeling dissatisfied with their body or, um, you know, whatever. And so it's getting to the bottom of that. And there is nothing wrong with aesthetic pursuits at all, like not at all. And I think that that is actually another thing where the fitness industry has actually demonized having aesthetic pursuits now, because it's like, you should just focus on being functional and strong. And it's like, then people are not being heard. We're not listening to people and what is actually going on for them. Um, but it takes a brave trainer to kind of like, go deep in that and ask the bigger questions um, about what where motivations are actually coming from and what desires actually are and helping people see that what you're actually desiring you can probably get from something different than um, chasing an aesthetic even though there's nothing wrong with it if you really want it. I think if you were to take the majority of the world's trainers, coaches, personal trainers, Instagram coaches, whatever you want to call them, most of us get enter enter the coaching space for similar reasons. Aesthetics is probably in there somewhere, being really, really lean, um, looking good or looking desirable is a part of it. And I think the trainers who are now, who's now message, and I think you and I are on this boat, but you know, whose who's message is, is not about just aesthetics and it's about maybe it's longevity or it's whatever it is have been on their journey, have been on their own journeys at some point, their own journey of essentially what we're talking about. You know, we, we start with aesthetics. We start with dosing it incorrectly. We suffer physically and emotionally. And we realize actually there's maybe another way that this could be done. And I think that's and certainly speaking from behalf of myself is like, that's where my prescription changed. And mm. the way that I dose it changed as a reflection of my own experiences. What do you think? Yes, I, I think that what I'm trying to do is help people find true liberation, because I think that we can like true liberation with exercise and with the way that they think about themselves, because I think that the practical thing of exercise, fitness, strength training, whatever, the application of that cannot have the effect that we want it to have as much as it could potentially have to help people reach their maximum physical potential if we're not looking at how people are thinking about exercise and thinking about themselves within exercise 
And so that is where the liberation comes. That's where autonomy comes from, you know? And we talk, you know, we both talk about, um, I think you just did a post today, didn't you? About self-regulation and auto-regulation. And these are protocols that we use within, when we're thinking about program design and stuff like that. But we have to be thinking, we have to be having those bigger conversations of how people are fitting themselves into exercise and how they're thinking about it. And that goes back to those bigger motivations and bigger desires because, when we truly understand that, that's when we can we can move out of suffering with it because there is so much suffering that we we go through with exercise, which is just so wild because it's like a thing that can really you know make our lives better. Mm. But we we get lost in it because it's like I'm not performing how I should. I don't look how I should for how I train. Someone else is doing something better than me. I've missed a workout. I should be doing this. I should be running. Blah, blah, blah. And we get so lost in it. And that is where the suffering is, right? Because we attach so many meanings to that. And it's like, we just have to dissect all of that. And, but we, we, I think like what you said is, and this is the thing, right? That um, what, what I did, I did a post recently was like, um, what did I say? I said expertise, um, experience doesn't, um, I can't remember what I said. Anyway, you know, this idea of like embodiment, you know, it's like, how do we embody these things? And it's like, you have to go through the stuff to be able to truly embody it, to truly teach it, I think. And that's where I also see a lot of stuff in the fitness industry where there, it might be confusing because there's people that might be teaching like about body image and stuff like that. But then you can see that they are still struggling themselves. Mm. Yeah. And so there is like these these processes that we we have to go through, I think. But that's not a bad thing because it's all a process and it's all an evolution and it's all just like where we are right now. Um, but I think I do think that going back to that idea of like what is walking the walk or talking the talk within fitness, it's not a look. I mean, a look or performance metrics could be a byproduct of the way that you walk the walk or talk the talk with your value system and who you are as a human and how you make people feel seen and heard and understood. And if the byproduct is that, like whatever your body looks like or however you eat or however you train or whatever performance you kind of have going on, that's amazing. But um, looking at looking at that, you know, our value system and how we're actually embodying that, I believe is like walking the walk talking the talk and that's how we go through our processes as fitness professionals as well yeah it's like but the thing is that as well if your true belief system of where you are at in your journey as a coach is aesthetics is everything then technically you are walking the walk right right but yeah. it's just you know your walk is just actually not not what should be what is required for the outcome that you're you're selling which is you're selling right. you know happiness and fulfillment and confidence and you know exuberant health yet that's not what you're talking about so it, it, i totally agree i also you know i always think about the quote which is like you know it's, it's one thing to study war but it's another to live the warrior's life which yeah. is like nothing nothing replaces experience and i think as a coach you know going back to the listening part and understanding is having had that experience allows us to fully empathize with an individual who's also going through it. And I think, right. you know, as knowledgeable as you may be on a subject, if you haven't experienced the thing, it's very, very hard to be with that person where they're at and fully understand what they're going through. And, you know, I always talk about it. You know, I, I, my team takes a piss out of how crippled and old I am and how much I have to self-regulate and deload in training. But and, and I also got asked a question one of my coaches, like, if you could change one thing, what would it be? Um, I can't even remember what my answer was, but his response was, surely it would be like to not have had your knee and shoulder injuries. And I said, I'm actually really grateful for my knee and shoulder injuries. Yeah, sure. I could never, it meant that I could never be the athlete that I wish I, I could be because I still dream about being a professional athlete. I would have loved to experience that at some point in my life. But I'm also so grateful that it gave me that journey, that experience that allows me to now probably be the coach I can be because I've walked that walk that so many of the people that I now work with are going through, whether it's injury, rehabilitation, 
can't not having to learn new movements, you know, not having control or understanding themselves, essentially all my values, which would inherently not values that I had to work on and create and cultivate, you know, I can resonate and empathize with all those people. So yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. I think, you know, what you said before about, you know, someone who is really like, focus on aesthetics and stuff like that like again there's absolutely nothing wrong with it like if, because whatever someone believes and like whatever someone's truth is is their truth is that truth, that's yeah. when, is that's what gets so messed up like when people are like fighting on the internet of like what is right or wrong in fitness and stuff like that it's like I mean yes there is kind of like some things that are right or wrong you know science and whatever but there's things that are also kind of very subjective and that is someone's truth and that is just like their experience. And so it's just like, you know, and it's like people that, like I said, who are, who say that we shouldn't have aesthetic pursuits and stuff. It's like, but we absolutely can because that's the whole point is autonomy, but making sure that that is truly what you want and there mm. isn't something else underlying that that is pushing you rather than pulling you towards that you know what i mean yeah well i mean living long and prospering isn't actually everyone's goal that's you know i think if you speak to 90 percent of world-class elite level athletes like they're not thinking about life at 90 or else <laughs> yeah. they probably wouldn't be doing their sport so you know who are we to say that you know, longevity, sustainability, and living long and prospering is what everyone should be pursuing. No, that's just what I believe in. And that's what my pursuit is. And that's the people I want to work with. Yep, uh, exactly. Uh, fucking fantastic. Um, what's the word? Diversion from where we were actually going down. But but love always love those things with you, Liv. Let's go back to you moving, transitioning from bodybuilding to CrossFit. So the mm. self-narrative as a bodybuilder was all about lean is better. Did that narrative change moving into CrossFit? Because I have seen photos of you as a CrossFitter and I've seen photos of you as a bodybuilder and they don't look the same. So I feel like something changed in there. Um, what do you mean they don't look the same? You were, you were much, much leaner as a bodybuilder than you were mm. as a CrossFitter, I feel. Maybe that's just because I'm referring to a photo of you on stage, maybe. Yeah, I um, I d also didn't have as much muscle when I was doing bodybuilding. Like that was a long time ago. Mm. I still, you know, had a lot of muscle to kind of build. Um, which you know is an important point that it takes a long time to build muscle. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people kind of forget that when they're um kind of wanting that aesthetic or athletic kind of look. It's like it takes time, but um. Yes. Well, initially I thought something had changed. I thought that I had gone into CrossFit and I was like, that's it. This is the answer to all of my problems. If I no longer have to focus on just what I look like and I can just focus on performance, I'm like, amazing. This is cool. We're just like getting strong. We're getting fit. We're just doing fun things. But with CrossFit comes an aesthetic. And I think that that's where it, like people get really tripped up, especially women, because it's like, okay, this is really cool. And I think that there is this journey that a lot of people kind of go on where a lot of women, especially maybe go on where they start getting into the gym three by 12, you know, you know, kind of like, or maybe start with cardio equipment and go into the weights room three by 12. Um, then find sort of functional fitness, maybe start doing like a CrossFit class or something like that and get really hooked. And they're like, wow, this is awesome. Like we're doing bear squats and cleans and stuff like that. And then it's like, but all the CrossFitters look like this and I don't look like this. And so that's where it's like, I need to look athletic as well. I need to look the part. And that's what tripped me up. And mm. that's where, and yeah. And that's mm. where, um, you know, I, I really, you know, even our years together, I'm like, man, I could have done so much more. Like I was just not strong. I mean, I was pretty fit, like uh, enduring, but not very strong. And I just couldn't get stronger. It's because I wasn't eating anything. Mm. And, um, and it pains me because I'm like, man, what could have I have done? Um, 
although I've got my eyes set on masters. So yes, <laughs> like, me too. Yes. <laughs> excited for that next year. And I'm excited because finally, you know, after having, you know, from sort of 2017, pulling back on training all over all of those years so I could heal my body to getting to a point where I just had to not even go into a gym, then getting pregnant and now coming back postpartum and like having such a healthy relationship with myself and exercise. I'm like, Oh my gosh, what can I do Mm. to not fear food and to not fear rest and to not fear the grit and the grace, like working really hard, but also, um, you know, the skill that are cultivated with self-compassion and how that comes into training and, you know, pursuing athletics and stuff like that. Um, So that's really exciting. But yeah, I think that that's a common journey with people, with women um, and men who get kind of like, I need to look like an athlete. Like I'm doing all of this athletic stuff, but I don't look like it. And so that's where maybe I need to, you know, getting into macros and counting and then not eating enough um, to look the part and then not performing well. And so it's like this like cycle Mm. that we get into that was that was me and i think it's one of the it was a really powerful move by crossfit whether it was intentional or not by you know having the idols of the crossfit games be such a driving force behind the affiliate level and people getting into crossfit gyms because they, they aspired to want to be like these people but where it got lost was that people in the affiliates who were technically there training for health were now emulating everything that the elite was doing and i think as well thinking back to the elite in 2010 2014 2015 really like the elite also wasn't knowledgeable on how to fuel themselves appropriately for the sport so you know you look at the the lineup i I think it was for one of the swim events in the 2014 crossfit games i think it's matt chan it's like the spieler rich froning kyle casper bauer and they are fucking shredded like mm-hmm. ready to step on stage shredded. You look at those guys now, they're still jack, but they're not shredded. And like yeah. I, said, I think especially in the in the female like competitive side, like seeing a six pack at the CrossFit Games or you know, even just watching this weekend at semifinals, like you don't really see girls with six packs anymore. 2014, everyone had a six pack. And so I also think the sport has evolved, the knowledge within fueling, the knowledge within, you know, how to make high level competition sustainable um because you know a lot of people dropped out got churned out overdid it couldn't recover uh and eventually either had to take a year out or make drastic changes um yes you're going to have some people that you know someone like an ari annie thorosdos is going to have a child and have a 12 pack six weeks later but you know they're anomalies you know they're uh you know they're, they're the outlier so i do think within that it's changing and it's evolving but i certainly you know getting to cross it myself like and being a coach, I, I've got to look, look a certain way. I've got to be a certain level of body fat. Uh, and if I'm going to be training with my shirt off, which is apparently what everyone does in CrossFit, like I better look the part. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, you're right that there are, there is more awareness about um, better fueling and stuff like that. And people like Sarah Sigmund's daughter coming out and talking mm. about her struggle with, um, you know, amenorrhea and stuff like that um, and how that affected her her performance right because getting injured um but there's also still not a lot of awareness I mean I recently listened to a podcast with a high level um CrossFit Games athlete um and she said outwardly that she didn't have a period and laughed about it you know and it was like a joke um and it's just like ah this is just like health that we're talking about here it's not I mean, whatever she wants to do as an, you know, a high level athlete, but knowing that the people that are listening to that podcast, so many people that might be like, oh, it's okay. Mm. It's it's okay for her because there still is that really weird murky, those murky lines with CrossFit of high level athletes and health people that are just going into the gym, you know, just want to have a pump, you know, that kind of stuff. And so when we're still laughing about this stuff or like talking about it as if it's not a problem and general popula- population are hearing it then that is a problem yeah I, th- I think it's where you know that person who's in a position of influence it's you know right. they have a responsibility to say that you know this is my decision but I'm also pursuing performance like 
maybe health and to, 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 to declare or maybe this individual doesn't even have the awareness yet to know right, that what so she's saying and say, doing yeah. is not actually a healthy thing but you know in a position to be like you know this is my choice in this this chapter of life and perhaps i'm making a choice for what's going to happen later i'm not prioritizing health but if health and reproduction and xyz is important to you then you know don't follow my pursuit type thing yeah but you know who knows but then i I think that that also is not i mean there's you know this athlete has a coach and so there's also kind of you know what are the conversations like in terms of like recovery and stuff like that or is that a decision that you're making together that you're just going to sacrifice that part of your health and your life for what you're doing right now like is that a conscious thing um or you know what is that assessment process and that check-in process um and what is that actually covering you know so um yeah it is really important that we are um asking or talking to our female athletes about this stuff um and making them feel safe enough to actually share what is actually going on for them so that they can be best supported because an exercise prescription for women is only going to be as effective on them as their health is and this is something that we teach in the female health and performance course is that when you take a health first approach then the results will be the byproduct of that you know um but that is not an approach that most people kind of take it's like results first and whatever happens with health whatever you know whatever (laughs) but when you take that health first approach let's take me through like a a basic checklist and i know it's individualized not everyone's the same but like you know for women listening to this who are now thinking like i I wonder if i'm checking the boxes for you know at the bare minimum what olivia is referring to as health you know what are some of those things that we need to be checking off and, and just to help provide some form of guideline yeah well i mean obviously with your menstrual cycle if you are someone that's training you know most of your listeners are probably um you know, female listeners are training pretty hard or interested in in fitness and stuff. So, you know, making sure that you are getting your menstrual cycle, if you are a menstruating um, person, that you are getting that each month and just taking note of anything that sort of goes a bit weird with that, you know, is it like late? Is it early? Is it heavier? Is it lighter? You know, all of those things can give you information, but we're not doing it in isolation, like as a month, right? If we're seeing, because things always change. So if you're seeing like a changing trend over like three months, maybe you don't have a period. Um, Maybe it's just like really, really early. It's really short. Um, You know, those, if that's happening over a three month period, then it's time to be like, okay, I need to go and get this checked out. Um, So in terms of that, like that's, that's a really important thing for women. Um, but just, you know, and that'll tell you a lot, right? Like if, if you don't have that or if something is going weird, then it's like, okay, what is happening with my nutrition? Like, am I eating enough? Am I resting enough? Um, what happens if I pull back a little bit on exercise and do things kind of go back to what is my quote unquote normal? Um, so yeah, for female, like for women who are training, um, and that's not just like athletes, right? This is like gen pop because mm-hmm. so many of us who are just like working out cause it's fun and we just like to work out, um, this all still applies. So making sure that you are actually eating enough, um, and, um, you know, all the usual, I mean, all the usual stuff, right? Like sleep, stress, managing your mind, um, making sure that you are, you know, training appropriately for the stresses that you've got in your life. And as your life load goes up, then you might want to think about your training load going down or, you know, if your life load is kind of down, then maybe your training load can kind of come up because we always need to be balancing training with, with life, I think, Um, because Mm. those two journeys, fitness life and, and life life, they are not separate and they work together. You know, we don't train in a vacuum. So that didn't really answer your question, did it? No, it did. It did. It did perfectly. But you actually just brought, you just remind me of something else. You know, we just started something the process with all of our online programs, which is basically a daily check-in. Uh, mm. And the goal is to try to cultivate higher levels of self-awareness. And so yeah. before you start every session, you've got to answer four questions. One being, um, you know, what is my mental readiness? What is my physical readiness? Um, how well am I coping with stress at the moment and what's my mood and essentially you 
one to five on each of them, you have a total for the day of 20. Um, and so we're, we, we launched this on Monday um, and, you know, mm. our subscribers around the world are all pretty much doing it. And super interesting already seeing, because this is something that I've been doing for quite a long time. Now. I do a daily check-in on my journal every single day and it's been super powerful for me in being able to reflect on a weekly and a monthly basis and tallying up like just how impactful the months. And before this podcast, we were talking about like, how am I actually doing? And I said that I, I didn't realize how tough the four months of the closure was until the gym opened again. And one of the wake up calls for me is that at the end of each week, I tally up out those 20, I add them all up. So a total of 140 is, would be the best possible score. Um, total of 140 and you basically have a score and I've got now, you know, 12, 16 weeks of weekly totals. And I look back at the four months of closure and my totals were down. And at the time I thought I was living optimally and feeling good. And now mm. seeing what my totals are now I'm feeling, you know, now the gym's open, feeling purposeful back with the team, energy's good, sleeping well, body's feeling great. I'm like, wow, that was, you know, I was really not actually doing well. And so, you know, being able to give that to our community now and straight away seeing when reviewing people's scores, you know, how many people out of 20 are at 10s and 11s and 12s. And it's awesome as a coach checking in on those people being like, hey, Liv, I see you're at a 10 today. You know, just keep an eye on that over the next few days. If we don't start pod trending positively, maybe we need to actually pull back a little bit. Uh, yeah. So yeah, super cool. And that's, and that's the thing, right? Is that, you know, as fitness professionals, we're like, oh, we've got to like design the best training program. And it's like, mm. training is like the most important thing. And that is the cherry on top what we miss so much it's like okay movement assessment right like and then after the movement assessment it's like exercise prescription and it's going to be an amazing program blah, blah, blah. it's like we actually miss such a fundamental part which is actually assessing lifestyle lifestyle because, behaviors yeah yep because and and not just like general kind of chit chat about this because it is so individual and if we're thinking about um lifestyle prescription which is what we should be talking about because that is what supports our training, right? The training is on like the cherry on top of, you know, how we're managing life outside the gym, because like I said before, they're totally interconnected. Um, and when we properly assess an individual's like lifestyle factors, what is going on for them and like can prescribe within that, then that is when the exercise prescription that we're giving has so much more impact, you know? And that is when we can truly help people find their maximum physical potential, you know, and their light bulb to shine really bright. And so, um, and it can be hard, you know, I think that that's where people get really tripped up because it's like, oh, so I'm supposed to be like walking like 10,000 steps, which we know isn't like a true, you know, 10,000 steps isn't like a thing. Um, but I should be walking, I should be like sleeping, I should be managing my stress, but it's like, what does this actually mean for you? And that is really important that we take an individual approach with that stuff um, when working with people. But what you're saying, I am a prime example of this yesterday where I had a very short window to work out, which I find really hard as someone who is always like, I give myself like two hours to work out each day. Whatever that looks like in that is just like my time. It's really important. Like you, it's just like nobody comes in the way of this. And so having a baby now, I'm just like, ah. I mean, I love him, but slightly annoying. Um, but yesterday I had a really short window and I was like, okay, this is the work that I want to get done in this time. And so didn't warm up, didn't do an assessment of how I was actually feeling, hadn't slept at all the night before, hadn't eaten, feeling quite stressed, had quite a bit of stuff to do with work, started just a push press, started way too heavy and tweaked my neck. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, yeah, this is, pay attention, Olivia. And it was just a lesson for me, you know? And it's not like a, oh, you're such an idiot for doing this. It's just like, oh, okay, cool. Like, this is my life. This is my body telling me something and I need to listen to that. And isn't that interesting? And when, mm. we, when we can just like take that approach with it as well and just be like super curious about what our body is telling us, then we have so much more success, so much more sustainability with fitness as well. Just like what you're doing with your guys with the process programming. It's like, 
even doing that assessment for a couple of weeks is enough for them to kind of start to understand what they need to actually look mm -hmm. at and how they can start to um, adapt their training each day for what comes up for them. I mean, it's, it's but what you've just done there is what we all do. Even as someone like myself who preaches this stuff all the time, like, you know, we're, totally. we're creature, creatures looking for the path of least resistance with everything. That's why we're so bloody dominant as a species on this planet is we're super efficient. And if I can get away with doing the same thing that I did last week, but do less to get it, I'm going to try it. And you know what? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you do get away with it and it's great. And you're like, oh, well, I got away with it last week. I'll get away with it this week. But no, that's when your body reminds you. And I love it. I'm like, ah, that is so good. Just a little reminder, like go back to the basics at work. And I, I get this with sleep all the time. You know, like I have such regimented sleep, sleep routines because I know it's what works. But sometimes I think, you know what? Fuck it. Do I really need to stretch tonight? Nah, do I really need to meditate? Nah, like maybe I can just watch TV for a little bit longer or I could just do a bit more work for 30 minutes later. And you go to bed that night and actually kind of sleep. And you're like, I've been wasting my time all this time in those stupid sleep routines. And the week goes by and suddenly you're not sleeping again. And you're like, why the fuck am I not sleeping? Like I was yeah. sleeping great last week. What, what is wrong with me? And then all it takes yeah. you to do that sleep routine one more time. You're like, oh, it works again. And that yeah. cycle just repeats over and over again, even when you go through the whole tracking process of checking scores and reviewing them. It still happens. Right. And I think that that is really important to talk about as well, because it's like, like people see us talking about all of these things, like on our, you know, social media and like our clients and stuff like that. And it's like, man, we're all humans and we're all kind of like what we were talking about before you know it's like we have gone through our own processes and all of our years of our own you know of our own suffering which is you know unique to us or our experiences um but we still find things hard it's like you know all of the years of work that I've done on body image I still have bad body image days you know but I it affects me a lot differently like it doesn't make me change my actions where it may have done in the past but it's still there because we're human we have emotions we have thoughts like and this is a really important thing to to share you know as fitness professionals and it's the same as the um like you know the aesthetics thing it's like we we still all kind of the like have these thoughts you know we're not immune from this we're not immune from going in and going hard and being like oh I shouldn't have done that that's really annoying um but we can give ourselves compassion for that knowing that we're just a human having a human experience and one of the pillars of self-compassion is knowing that you know that as humans we're all kind of like in a, we all experience suffering you know yeah totally Liv, I want to just go back a little bit because um, you talked about the process of, okay, acknowledging that something has to change. You've obviously got mm -hmm. reach this point in your life where, you know, you're, you're thinking about potentially having a baby, trying things, things aren't working. Talk me through that whole idea of like, you know, you tried all the science and it didn't work, but it wasn't until you changed your beliefs. You essentially changed you as a person mm -hmm. that, that the magic happened. Talk me through all that what did you try and what did, what eventually was it what was the catalyst that made you start thinking about things differently um a lot of it was I felt like I was I just felt like I felt like a phony that's a big part of it I felt like I was teaching a lot of stuff that I wasn't embodying so that kind of relates to what we've been talking about you know and that felt gross like I got to a point where I was like why am I, why am I teaching this stuff? And I am not, why do I not think that I'm worthy enough of having my health? Like, why do I think that I need to like keep this body shape, sacrificing my health when I'm teaching the exact opposite to people, you know, it just didn't mm. make sense to me. So that was a big kind of catalyst for me to start to do the hard things but I tried to do everything that I could to not gain weight. So for me to get my period back, I had to gain weight. I had to eat more. I had to eat, exercise less. And so there was a lot of identity stuff around that, right? I was like, so I'm going to be a coach 
in the fitness industry and I'm going to gain weight, I'm going to exercise less, who's going to want to work with me? And like how I felt embarrassed, you know, I was like, this is what I am. This is everything that I am. Like, how can this be true? Um, even though I knew that that was what I needed to do and I knew that that was actually the right thing to do, but I had to work through what I thought that I had to be, you know, as a coach, like that was a big part of it. Just my, my career really. Um, but I tried to just, just talk, talk me through some of those struggles, mm-hmm. like through that journey of like the, the, the detachment from image to your profession as a coach and, and thinking that that image was what was attracting people to want to work with you and essentially giving you worth as a coach. Yeah. Well, it was weird because I, I really, um, even when I was like super lean, I hated people commenting on my body because I hate people. I hate being the center of attention. Like I hate people kind of like looking at me or, you know, whatever, but that is that the deeper thing of that is like a fear of judgment, right? Either Mm. way. Um, Yeah. And so um, it was weird because I, it wasn't like I wanted people to comment on my body. I really hated people commenting on my, on my body, but I thought that, I needed to look the part, basically. I needed to look the part to be a worthy coach because I didn't think that I was smart enough. That's a, like a big thing. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think I was good enough as a coach if I didn't look it. And so it was like the easier but the harder way through was if I could maintain a physical shape, then I would be okay. So it was mm. like, if that was taken away, then it was like, oh my gosh, now I have to deal with like not being smart enough or not feeling good enough. And that's really hard. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I did everything to like try and heal my body without putting on weight, but it was like, uh, that is just not going to work. So um, I had to, uh, so I worked with a coach um, to help me and that was really important. And she had gone through something very similar. Um, she had not had her period for around the same time as me. So many, many years as well, like quite a similar story. So I felt like she understood me um, and she could, you know, get where I there's, was there's that, em- there's that empathy part again that we were talking about. 100%. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's been the same with me. You know, I've had people come to me hearing my story and they're like, oh, you, you get it. And so you can you know, empathize with me and we can, you can help me. So, um, yeah. And it just took, I don't know what it was. I, so we went through IVF and IVF didn't work. Um, and that was it for me to be like, you have to do this. Like you, if you want to have a baby and whether I actually wanted to have a baby then is like a whole different story. It was something that I was kind of like dealing with, but, um, and how that was going to change my identity and, you know, my identity in the fitness industry and stuff as well. Um, but IVF didn't work. And I was like, I have to do the hard thing. Like I have to pull the trigger on this. Um, and so I just signed up with this coach and I just did it. And I knew that as soon as I signed up with her, I wouldn't be going to a gym. I'd have to eat more. I just had that accountability that I just had to do it, you know? Um, And that's, you know, there is an energy exchange, you know, when you give someone money, um, there is an energy exchange with that, like energetically that you are saying to yourself, I'm worthy of whatever this is. And so I think that it was me just like paying money was me saying to myself that I'm worthy of this investment, I'm worthy of my health, and I'm worthy of going through this whole thing. Um, so I'm going to do it. So yeah, so I think that it was um, the IVF not working um, and me knowing what the truth was that I was like, you can't hide anymore. Like you have to do this. Can I ask when you, you knowing that truth, were you did you share that with anyone else? No, because I was still kind of working it out. So I see that in like in hindsight now. Um, at the time, I was just like crying all the time. I was just like, I don't want to do this. I don't mm. want to do this. The, inev- um, the inevitable thing was happening, but you didn't want to have to get there. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, honestly, it's a really hard thing to, we know that, we know that um, everyone tells us that gaining weight is a bad thing. We know that it's not, right? I mean, we, we have the knowledge and stuff like that. We know it's not a bad thing. I mean, of course, it's very sort of depending on what someone's situation is. But we know that a body is not a sign of anyone's worth or a, a sign of health or, you know, whatever. We don't know what's going on, on under the hood for people. But even knowing that and having the knowledge that I have, the experience that I have of being a coach and stuff like that, it still felt so hard to not work out and actively gain weight when everything around you, everyone around you is telling you that that's bad, <laughs> whether that is like intentional or not, you know, that that is a bad thing. And I had, you know, a number of comments, like even family members that are like, oh, are you going to eat all of that? Or, oh, wow, you you look different and stuff like that. And that's really, really hard. When you are pursuing that for your health and people don't see that because they can't, they, nobody knows what's going on, right? People just see you gaining weight and they're like, oh, something's gone wrong here. You know, like, oh, she's fallen off the wagon or something like that. And it's like, that is why we, you know, something that I will, the hill I will die on is that health does not have a look. Health does not have a look. Um, and so that was really hard, you know, um, to, to go through that when there is just like everything, like marketing, everything, fitness industry, social media, blah, 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 around me saying that it's a bad thing that you're gaining weight. And so to I keep mean, on going, that is yeah. like a hard thing. It's like, you know, things like, because the thing is, at the end of the day, as much as we say that, and I agree totally you know, being athletic and looking athletic does, it does, we can't lie and deny to say that it does help your business as a coach. You're just, you're a, you're at a massive disadvantage if you are not shredded, lean, jacked, and you are promoting yourself as a coach in the online space. I think the message you're trying to say is that, which I totally agree with, is that as a consumer, we need to dig a little deeper than that. Yes. And I, yeah, totally. And it's hard because consumers will look for, you know, a, a coach whose, whose body is their business card, right? I mean, that's kind of what we look at. Um, but the process that I went through of like gaining weight, getting my health back, um, being in the place where I am now, Oh my gosh, I am so grateful and I'm so grateful for all of the struggle with that because I am so much of a better coach. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm the coach that I've always wanted to be. And I feel like I am the person that I've always wanted to be. You know, I've always been someone that's like, I wish I could have balance. Like, how do these people have a sandwich and be okay with that? You know, and now I'm like, I'm having a sandwich and I'm fine with that. Or, you know, I can have a rest day and I'm fine with that. But I can also be super interested in performance and pursuing the things that I want to, but it's without the drama. And that is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and so, and also kind of like what I was saying before is that now that I've gone through all of that, I have more headspace to actually think about, you know, I've got more room, more capacity for my clients. I've got more capacity for impact that I want to make, you know? Um, and that's yes. a really beautiful, really freeing kind of thing. But I think that there was a fear for me, you know, as an individual who's interested in fitness, there was a fear that would I come out the other side of this and not have that passion for training and that passion for fitness because if that was something that kept me motivated because although I was still interested in performance um I was also like I'm doing sort of you know a lot of this to try and have this body shape as well so it was kind of like a weird thing but I had a fear that I'd come out the other side and I wouldn't have that that passion anymore 
Um, and I was like, well, what's it going to mean for my business? But um, I did come out the other side and I'm as in love with training and fitness, like even more in love than I ever have been. Um, and that has been a really, really, really beautiful thing for me to be in this place of like, it gives me shivers thinking about it, of like true, pure love for training without anything else, no layers, you know, there's no layers of shoulds or have tos or anything like that, but just like a very authentic love for training. Um, and that's a really, really beautiful, a beautiful thing that's come out of it as well. I love the way that you put that because I resonate so deeply with that because in many ways, your journey is very similar to my, my journey. I just didn't have a menstrual cycle to have to deal with. <laughs> and the reminders, the wake up, the wake, the wake up calls that I had were more just along general health, burnout, um, fatigue, pain, um, which essentially I, you, I know actually having coached you that a lot of those things were a part of things that you were suffering yeah. from as well. You just had you know, the menstrual cycle part on top of that. But, you know, where I'm at now is a genuine love for training, not feeling any pressure to have to do mm. anything. And just like being explorative again and, you know, like playing sport again. Like I didn't play sport. I grew up my whole life playing sport and that was my thing. And then somewhere along the way, training took precedence and priority over sport. Uh, and I didn't want to stop training and replace training for sport because I was afraid that I would lose muscle and get fatter. That's crazy to think about. I'm still playing sport. It's stupid still moving i'm still exercising but now you know finding the love for like movement you know maybe yeah. breaking away from the concept of calling it training but you know like i'm playing football again which i've not haven't done in 10 years you know i'm going out running i'm going like i'm doing water sports i'm playing tennis and it's like i love this stuff and i'm like i also feel absolutely no pressure whatsoever mm. to say i'm not going to train today or I'm going to take the weight down, or I'm going to adjust this to that. And, you know, like my team finds it hilarious, but I also think it's because a lot of them aren't at a place in their life yet where they have the ability to do that without fear of judgment or without yeah. self-sabotage. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, yeah, sorry, go. No, I was just going to say, I, I, you know, and this is, this is, this is the bridge that I'm always trying to, like the gap that I'm always trying to bridge is that, that we can want to train hard you know we can want to like get after it and like just like lift heavy things and like move fast and breathe hard and like you know go really hard but we can also want to not you know and I think that what we see is kind of um sometimes it can go too far one way you know that maybe there's like the camp that's like oh just rest like slow down like you know don't go in the hassle and blah, 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 blah. but then there's a the people that are like go hard or go home and it's like ah we can have both like we we can exist in both that like we can want to go really hard and it doesn't mean that we're doing ourselves a disservice and we can rest and it doesn't mean we're doing ourselves a disservice and what all of this is wrapped up in is just awareness of self Yes. and that we can modulate between these and um yeah i think it's just like finding that finding that space between um and that is the grit and that is the grace you know for us to embody and find yeah it's like you know the way that i think about it is is during most of the year i value feeling good and feeling energized and sleeping well and having a sex drive, I value those things really, really highly. Because I've also been many times in my life where I haven't had any of those things at play. And so because of that, like training becomes more about restoration, play, exploration. And it's generally speaking a lot easier. But I also love competition. And I'm probably going to love competition until the day I die. Like I turn everything into a competition, uh, mm -hmm. but that's just hardwired in me. I think it's something that's like just a part of you and I love it. And I'm not ashamed of it. And I don't think it's a bad thing. And I don't try to suppress it. So I do know that there's parts or seasons of my life where 
the training does need to be harder. And actually at that point and that point in time, let's say leading into the cross open, because I'm going to do the open again and I'm going to do the quarterfinals again. And I'm going to do it probably for as long as I possibly can, because I love it. Um, you know, at that point in time, you know, maybe all those things that are priorities right now won't be priorities and that's okay. I'll just, I'll make that change. Um, and I'll buy into that change wholeheartedly. You know, this year I learned that I probably last season, sorry, I probably aired on the size of taking it easy for far too long that I didn't set myself up for success when the cross open rolled around. And I went into intensity that I hadn't really prepared myself for. And to be honest, I was fucked for about mm. 10 weeks after cross open, like genuinely it has taken me 10 weeks to bounce back to feeling good again. Uh, and people think I'm lying or joking when I say that. And I'm like, no, cause I know I have the awareness to know what good feels like. And I know that I'm still not there. And I have these markers around me every day that reminds me, Ed, you're still not quite there yet. And so until yeah. I get there, I'll continue to take it easy. But again, that is, that is a result of years of cultivation of self-awareness, understanding what the priority is now, what I want to achieve and yeah, connecting the dots. I, although I do wonder if you're just in like a permanent deload, but, um, but that's Basically. okay as well. Ed. That's okay. Basically. Um, but I, I think that sometimes, um, and I know that this is something that comes up for a lot of my clients when they go through this process, a lot of my clients, they, 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 come to me and they are in this place of like I need to go hard like I don't have a great relationship with exercise like I feel guilty if I'm not dead on the floor like I don't really know how to find this 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 place you know um and what they often go through is this process of like okay starting to unpack their relationship with exercise and how that relates to themselves and their body and stuff like that and then they get into this place of like, oh, okay, cool. Like, I don't have to work out today or um, I can, you know, be kinder to myself and, you know, these kind of things, which is really, really cool. But then if they want to go a little bit harder or maybe they feel like they push too much, they feel guilty. And they like try and find this like this this place of like, I, how do I know if I'm actually doing the right thing? Or how do I know if I'm, I'm pushing too much or not enough? And that is a skill to be cultivated, right? And I think it's just like constantly checking in with yourself. And you can kind of feel that as well. It's like, do I feel kind of like, like restricted in my body? Or do I feel kind of like open and excited? You know, I think that we can kind of feel that we're making the right decision um, if we're just kind of like paying attention to that. And it's just a constant process and a constant evolution of paying attention and having that awareness to actually start to trust yourself enough to make those decisions of where, where to push and where to pull back um, with training. Yeah, and you will never know unless you push like you need to cross that line like periodically exactly. because because the yes. line the line when you're 25 is really really high but the line when you're 35 yes. isn't very high at all and you know right. depending, depending on what else is happening in life outside of the gym is going to dictate where that threshold is and it's our job yeah. to constantly check in every now and then to just find yourself find remind yourself where that line is and again, like going back to what we talked about, like there is no greater teacher than experience. And like, you need to put yourself through it. You need to spend periods of time where you're undercooking it and you're not doing enough to actually get better at anything. You need to also spend periods of time where you're overdoing it, doing too much that actually going backwards. And then, you know, and, and, you, and when you find the sweet spot, I promise you the sweet spot today is probably not going to be the same sweet spot tomorrow. And it's not going to be the same sweet spot in a year or two. Um, but, you know, yeah. and I think, uh, yeah, sorry, go. Oh no, I, I was just going to say, um, you know, this week in Grit and Grace, which is my on online program, it's our baseline testing week. So we, and this is where I'm like 10 out of 10, like I can go for it, like leave it all out there. We're testing strength and fitness, you know, whatever. Um, but know that most of the time we're working underneath this and they all know that, like they know that most of the time we're working under threshold, but this is the week for you to go. And if you feel like if you fail a lift or if you like go way too hard or whatever, good. 
like good that's not a reason for you to feel bad or guilty or like oh my gosh I shouldn't have gone so hard or whatever it's like nah that's like giving you great information for where your threshold actually is like you said that changes day to day right with whatever kind of like your body is capable of but understanding that threshold is so important and I think that there are a lot of people that don't go there enough to actually understand how to train sub-maximally which is what we want to actually get better um and yeah it's a, it's a really really important part of of fitness but then on the other hand you know people think that they're going there but they're actually not because they're just like there all the time and so they're actually just at 70 percent all the time and not actually at what they're capable of <laughs> me yeah <laughs> Uh, Liv, so what is now that you've had Alfie mm. and you've, you, you know, you've, it, the process has allowed you to now be a happier individual, a more purposeful coach. You're able to give more to your clients, all these amazing things that have come out of this whole journey and process. Maybe we've already asked to answer this question in this whole conversation, but looking back at it all now, if you would have done it differently and could have done it differently, what would you have done differently? Oh my gosh, my whole, like that, that question, my whole body, just like, I have like a visceral reaction to it. Um, and what I'll say, you can't, what you can't say is, oh, I'm grateful for it all happening. Cause that's the person I am today. I know hypothetically no. that's a great answer, but no, dig in. Yeah. Um, eat more, first of all, um, eat more, um, but get help, not for my what I thought that I needed help for, which was um, what I was doing in the gym, but getting help for how I'm thinking about mm. what I'm doing in the gym. Yes. Um, yeah. And so I think that, that that is probably what I would change. And then the carry on, you know, the domino effect from that would be probably better performance, eating more, a healthier body, more joy, um, better relationships, um, more experiences, all those kind of things. Nice. What does the future hold for you now, Liv? Well, you're coming up. You know, Anything exciting? Have you heard that quote, wherever you go, there you are? Yeah. Wherever you go, there you are. And right now, you know, we've been talking about all of this stuff and, the changes and the shifts with, um, you know, self-worth and identity and, um, you know, training and all of this kind of stuff. Um, now that I've entered into motherhood, it's like, it's the same shit wrapped up in a different boat, you know, like wherever you go, there you are. And whenever we enter something new, the same stories come up, you know, the same stuff comes up. And so, Right now, I am taking my experience of all of these things that we've just talked about, where I can find more self-trust um, in my experience with motherhood. Um, and so that's kind of like what I'm going through right now, which is really interesting and hard and the hardest thing that I've ever done. <laughs> um, and just yeah figuring that out and just um being back in my business um with my clients and yeah gunning for the gunning for the crossfit masters next year and i'm really excited for that because it has been i've been in years of maintenance or regression and so for me to now be in a place obviously i'm postpartum so there's been a lot of like rehab work and stuff but I'm just sort of coming back, um, starting to lift a little bit more now, back doing pull-ups, you know, these kind of things. And so building up my capacity with all of this stuff. Um, and I'm just so excited to be in this place of progression with my training. It's just like, come on, like, let's go. Finally, after so many years of doing all of that work, I feel like I've really earned, earned this to be excited about progression. So that's something that I am really enjoying right now as well. I can't wait to see how it actually all unfolds. Like this, diff <laughs> this different live with a different mindset and a different body, taking a very different approach to maybe a goal that was similar ish to the past and how that all unfolds. It's going to be cool. 
it's exciting. I just need to get to Hong Kong so I can train at Costa and then yes. that would be really fun. Yes. Make it happen, please. <laughs> okay, Liv. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure as it always is. Thank you so much. Um, in the show notes, folks, you can find out how to get in contact with Liv. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're interested in the Grit and Grace program, check it out. Of course, you can find Liv on Instagram as well. Anything I missed there, Liv? No, I think that's that's about it. That's good. Well, it's been a pleasure, Liv. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ed. Always wonderful to talk to you.